Welcome, everyone, to TV Toastmasters here in Anderson Township on the edge of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm saying that because there are many TV Toastmasters all over the country, but the best one is this one here at the Anderson Community Center on ACT Television. So, welcome. I'm Sheila Mudd Baker. I'm the secretary of TV Toastmasters. And I'd like to welcome you to our April 5th, Thursday night, 6 p.m. television show and meeting. And to begin this evening, let us welcome the Toastmaster of the Day, Carol Cormond. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer, fellow Toastmasters, and our most welcome guests. We do have... Nick Whitten, who found us on the internet on Meetup, and we also have a family, Dwight Perry, dad, Nick per uh, Nathan Perry, his son, and his daughter, Caroline. We call her Carly, but she's going by Caroline here. <laughs> We'd like to welcome everyone and our viewing audience, and if you would like to come visit us, feel free to come anytime, 6 p.m. Thursday night or the first Thursday of the month, or 9 a.m. the third Saturday. We have fun in our meeting. If, you, if it isn't fun, it isn't Toastmasters. I would like to start our meeting with our impromptu session. We like to have a word of the day to help increase our vocabulary and our grammarian word counter, all, all counter word power is Shankar Rasa today. Good evening, everyone. Just for the kids, I thought to uh, just then throw out the word and, and, and see how many of us already know the meaning of ostensible, spelled O-S-T-E-N-S-I-B-L-E. -E. Anybody? So ostensible is used as an adjective, um, and it means professed or pretended, outwardly appearing as such, or being such an appearance. To use it in a sentence, an ostensible cheerfulness concealing sadness. Another usage could be, the ostensible purpose of the trip turned out to be a trick to get into the party, to the surprise party. So I'll leave the word of the day here, which is again ostensible, which means professed or pretended. Thank you. Thank you. A way in Toastmasters that we're ostensible, ostensible is that when we're up here and our knees may be shaking and our heart pounding, we put on this cool, calm, collected face and make people think that we're really cool, calm, and collected. But we're really accessible. Our next part of the meeting is the impromptu part. It's a lot of fun. And when you first come to table topics, you're going, oh, I hope they don't call on me. But after you get up and you have so much fun, then you're upset if they don't call on you in the future. And our table topics, you have one to two minutes to answer a question, not if you're choosing. And you have the option to either tell the truth, or make up something, let your imagination go wild, or say, that reminds me, and talk about something else. So you have a lot of leeway. It helps you to think quickly. When your boss asks you that question, you can't say, oh, well, let me get back to you. You have to come up with something, and this teaches you how to think instead of letting your brain shut down. Our super topics master today is Shankar. No, that was the wrong thing. Is Chris Tehan. That's the wrong place for me. And let us welcome Chris to our... Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Good, uh, good evening. Ostensibly, it may look like I was prepared for this, but uh, this was done in the last uh, uh, five or ten minutes. Um, I work downtown, and today is opening day for the Reds uh, and for baseball. Actually, technically, I think there was probably... 
a couple games last night or the day before. I don't know when it officially started, but uh, today was the Reds opening day, and I was downtown working and watching everybody go by and, and get, wearing their Reds gear and getting ready for the game. And, and even though it was just a touch chilly, it was uh, it looked like a beautiful day out, and I wish I could have been outside going to the game, but I was stuck inside uh, working. So with that, I thought we'd have that as a theme for our our uh, table topics uh, this week is around baseball and opening day, since today is opening day. So Carol, uh, what is your favorite baseball uh, experience or memory, either personally or watching professionals play? Thank you for that challenging question, seeing that I'm not a baseball fan, but I have been down to see the Reds play several times. And to me, the exciting part is to see how dedicated they are and, and see all the fans cheering for them. And today, the guy who was at our meeting last night, he's the town crier of Milford, and he was in the parade today, but I didn't get to see him. So I missed that on the Finley Day Parade. And then I learned at the Toastmaster meeting that I was at at noon, her cousin is one of the announcers, and she wasn't sure if he was going to be able to announce today, get in there. But she was hoping those connections might give her a free, she got someplace along the line, or discounted ones, and say, hey, get them for the whole club. That would be neat. <laughs> Have such wood communicators day down at the Reds. How close am I, Mary? <laughs> Not even a minute. So... I never had been to the Red Stadium, and the American, Great American Insurance Company, they have a Toastmaster meeting, and we had a meeting there a week or so ago, and looking out the window, I'm going, oh, that's neat, you can see down at the ball field there, right there, and I said, do you get to come here to work on Saturday, and so you can watch the game, and they're going, oh, it's a little bit far away, but it looked pretty good to me, but Rick said, he likes to be, he wants to be right behind the batter so he can see what's going on see all that stuff but it was neat when I went and sat right behind the third base I was right on the field practically and that, that was a neat trip so I'm not too I do hear things because I have three boys that can tell you everything about baseball they know players names they know every sport but not me Mr. Tabletop Smith thank you <laughs> And I've actually never been to the uh, Great American Ballpark myself. Um, I'm new to Cincinnati, but grew up in Columbus. But we used to go to uh, Reds games back in the old Riverfront Stadium. But I haven't been to the new ballpark yet, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to getting down there. Uh, the next table topic, uh, topic question is for Rick. And uh, is baseball still America's pastime, or has another sport taken its place? Thank you, Chris. Is baseball America's national pastime? I would think the major league would like you to believe that. But if you look around these days, fewer and fewer kids are playing baseball, and more and more kids are playing soccer. Everywhere I turn, there's soccer mom stickers on the back of minivans, people going to soccer tournaments, going to soccer practice, playing with soccer balls, using those hacky sacks so that they can practice their soccer skills. We have a baseball diamond in our neighborhood that sits empty all year long. No pickup games, no neighborhood kids playing baseball out there for fun and excitement. It sits empty all year long. Long. So based on my observation of Americana, I would say that no, America's favorite pastime is no longer baseball. It's been replaced by football, if you're from Europe, or soccer from the United States. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Rick. And I actually uh, agree with you that uh, certainly... 
uh, soccer is becoming more and more popular, and I actually am a fan of uh, watching soccer overseas because it's just so much more beautifully played over overseas uh, uh, versus in America. But although it is getting better in America, but I think uh, NFL football has really kind of taken over as America's national pastime. But uh, but hopefully baseball doesn't lose its grip too much. Uh, the next question is for uh, Shankar. And uh, how do you think the Reds are going to do this year? And are they going to make the playoffs? Thanks, Cliff. If I'm evaluating Reds, I'll be one of the terrible evaluators because I haven't followed any of the games that Reds played. I've been only once to the uh, stadium watching Reds and Indians, and uh, I... If I remember right, the Indians won the game, and all I did was eat cheese cronies. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention, the cheese cronies were super good from uh, the Thailand Chili. So if I were to evaluate Reds from that one game that I saw they played last season, I would say they were uh, not on par with uh, some of the biggest uh, teams playing this season, so they should be ending up somewhere in the middle. Have to the question. Uh, I'm always uh, hopeful that uh, I, you know, I grew up a Reds fan I, in Columbus. You kind of grew up either <clears throat> a Reds fan or a Cleveland fan, and and I was a Reds fan, so I'm always hopeful that they'll that they'll do well. But I I tend to agree with you; they'll probably end up somewhere in the. Um, hopefully, they'll be, they'll be first, but they'll probably end up somewhere in the middle of the pack. So. <laughs> Uh, the last question, I was thinking there was going to be two more questions, but Sheila is not uh, in the room, so I'm going to ask one last question, and that's for Nick. Um, should the statistics of the steroid era be a part of uh, baseball history, or should they be thrown out? Nick? Steroids in baseball history, it's been a hot topic for a while. Uh, unfortunately, steroids were a large portion of baseball for a while. And with that being said, it's debatable if they should be part of the history because uh, it gave an unfair edge to some of the players. But it was part of the history. I mean, that is the history of the sport. So I, I do think it should be incorporated into the history, uh, and the, stati the statistics should be kept, although they should probably be marked somehow, so that it's noted that there were drugs involved, but was p an unfortunate part of the history of the sport. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you, Nick, that uh, it is um, certainly was a, a black mark on the, uh, the history of baseball, but there have been other uh, black marks as well, and those those people are still in the Hall of Fame. So uh, certainly it, it'll be it give its just due in, in time, but uh, it should stay uh, as history. Uh, so that's my table topics for today. Thank you, Thank you very Chris. much, Chris. Jed Chesterwood, when they were talking about the Reds, they said whoever just signed like a $239 million contract guaranteed 10 or 12 years. And he said, don't know that I'll be able to make every game or play or something like that, but I'm going to do my best. And wouldn't you like a job like that where you're guaranteed 10 years? <laughs> and all you have to do is do your best. We're probably tonight for our first speaker. We now come to the prepared each part of our meeting. And our first speaker this evening, we are pleased, is our area governor, Rick Barron, and he is also the past president of last year. He is going to tell us tonight the story time, bringing history to life. I'm always ready to hear Rick as he does great speeches, and his title tonight is, Who's the Fool? Let us welcome Rick Barron, Confident Communicator. Thank you, Carol. 
How did you celebrate April Fool? Were you the butt of a joke or prank by a friend or relative? I was not. My wife and I were home by ourselves, and it's been a very, very long time since I remember falling prey to an April Fool's joke. But I got to thinking, there must be some history behind April Fool's. Why do we ostensibly look to this tradition on the 1st of April to pull tricks on one another? So I did a little bit of research, and I'm going to tell you my version of the April Fool story. Back in the Middle Ages, there were actually towns in Europe that did not celebrate New Year's Day on January 1st. They celebrated New Year's Day on the 25th of March. And in some towns, they actually had week-long celebrations for New Year's at the end of March. Some historians believe that those who celebrated on January 1st, created April Fool's Day to make fun of those who did not celebrate on the 1st of January. But history has a dichotomy there because one of the first references to April Fool's was in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in 1392, well before the Middle Ages. A little more research indicates that we may be able to pin this one on the Romans. On the 25th of March every year, the Romans celebrated a festival called Hilaria. And I wouldn't put it past the Romans to party for a week and finish that on the 1st of April. I sat back and I thought of the all of history there must be some really fabulous April Fool's pranks that got pulled. I did a little bit of research online, and I found plenty of websites listing all of the best April Fool's pranks. I found one that ranked the top 100 April Fool's pranks of all time, and I picked my three favorites here for you. The 1st of April, 1957, the BBC show Panorama, the announcer is talking about the bumper crop of spaghetti in southern Switzerland. He indicates that the crop is so big because of the mild winter that they had and the, quote, near disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, unquote. While the announcer is talking about all of the benefits of fresh pasta, viewers are treated to images of farmers up on ladders pulling spaghetti out of trees and putting it into baskets. The BBC was flooded that day with phone calls asking how they could grow their own spaghetti tree. Callers were told to take a sprig of spaghetti, place it into a can of tomato sauce, and wait. I wonder who waited the longest. April 1st, 1962. Swedish television station STV announces a major breakthrough in technology. They cut to an Einstein-looking gentleman sitting in the studio with a television set. He talks technically about how television works and starts using phrases like the prism nature of light, double slit interference, and then pauses and says he has discovered a way to turn black and white images into color. 
and that people could do it by placing a thin film over the front of their television screen. He indicates that viewers can use simple pantyhose to stretch over the television screen and watch programs in color. He cautions that you must make sure that you're at the proper distance from the set and that you may have to move your head from side to side every once in a while just to get things to line up. To this day, there are Swedes who remember parents and grandparents racing through the house, rummaging through drawers to find pantyhose that they could cut apart and stretch over their television set so they too can watch programs in color. I wonder how many pantyhose were ruined that day by people thinking that they could convert their sets to color. April 1st, 1996. The Taco Bell Corporation runs full-page ads in six major newspapers announcing that they had just purchased the Liberty Bell and were going to rename it the Taco Liberty Bell. They indicated that it was an effort to supplement the national debt and suggested that every major corporation should buy a piece of Americana to help lower the national debt. They likened it to adopting a mile on a federal highway. You see those signs that says that this portion was adopted by a specific corporation. A few hours later, they issue another press release that indicates people will still be allowed to view the Liberty Bell, but that unfortunately, it was now going to split its time between Philadelphia and the Taco Bell headquarters in Irvine, California. Well, people were outraged, calling into the National Park Service. Unfortunately, the National Park Service does not own the Liberty Bell. But that didn't matter. Calls flooded in to both the Park Service and the Taco Bell headquarters saying, how could you possibly do this? At noon, on April 1st, 1996, the Taco Bell Corporation issued another press release stating that the purchase was a hoax and that they would be donating $50,000 to the city of Philadelphia for the care and maintenance of the Taco No of the Liberty Bell. As you can see, Americans are very ostensible. My question is, who's the fool? If you were duped by a friend or family member on Sunday, you may have thought that you're the fool. But I say that we're all fools. We all want to believe, and we all want to know that there's something in it for all of us. It's still something. Thank you, Rick, for that enlightening speech. You all have these little ballots and brief evaluations to write a note of encouragement to the speaker, what you understood, what he did well, what he might do a little better. And I've always not liked April Fool's joke because they do make a fool of someone, and I subscribe to Fly Lady who teaches you how to organize, and she has these wonderful purple rags. And she said, we're not going to carry them anymore. Within, as soon as I hit the airway, she had 200 replies. How could you do that to us? So, I, And then she said, that was April Fool's. I will be quiet for the moment, and then we will be right back. Welcome back. We will now have our second speaker of this evening. Our second speaker is speaking from the Competent Communicator Manual, the basic manual. And she's on project number seven, Research Your Topic, and the topic of her speech is Farewell. 
Farewell, Sheila Mud Baker, distinguished Toastmaster. Distinguished Toastmaster Sheila Mud Baker, farewell. Farewell, Bud Gothorp. Bud, Bud Gothorp, who has been the manager of this television station, a member of the board of directors for this television station, the volunteer par excellence of all of Anderson Township, passed away yesterday of leukemia. Farewell, Bud. My favorite photo of Bud is a photo of Bud wearing a Viking helmet with the horns, standing in front of a reconstruction of a Viking ship, having a great time, laughing, laughing. And that's sort of what I think Bud will experience in his next life, a great time. Because Bud experienced life to its fullest when he was alive, and he shall do the next life <laughs> in the best and most wonderful way. So people would believe a lot of things about what makes an afterlife. If you were an ancient Sumerian, you believed you sat around under the dirt, eating dirt, staring at other people covered with dirt. Not a very exciting afterlife. If you were an Egyptian, your soul divided into parts, a ba and a ka, and a ka stayed behind with your body, so you had to have it mummified because it needed a job after your death. And the ba made the journey to the gods. And if it was really, really brave and very lucky, it would make it all the way and celebrate with the gods. That is, if you were the pharaoh, nobody know, knew what happened to those people who weren't pharaohs. But as time went on, everybody decided they wanted that too. So everyone believed that eventually they could make it. As long as evil spirits didn't eat your soul, your, your ba, that is, and as long as you could fight off enough gods, to make it all the way to the end, you will be fine. Christians, of course, believe in heaven and hell. Some Christians believe in heaven, hell, and purgatory. If you're Jewish, you don't believe in hell. But you don't believe in the same kind of heaven either. Um, kind of like a halfway house, or a sheol is what it's called. And if you're a Muslim, you probably... Uh, believe that if you're male, you're going to have a great time after your death. If you're female, not as much. But we would hope that it would be just as good for women as it was for men. If you're a Hindu, you believe you're probably eventually going to be reincarnated, just as you do if you are a Buddhist. You're probably going to be reincarnated. Now, you might get a stopping point along the way where you get to enjoy real pleasure, but you're going to move on to another life. So there are a lot of different beliefs people have about life. So many books have been written about the afterlife. Some of the more popular books are books by people who claim that they died, they remember their death, they looked down into the operating room, they saw their bodies, they moved on to heaven or to hell. So there are books about there's so much time in heaven or so much time in hell. Um, hell wasn't so much fun, but heaven seemed pretty nice. You get to see all of your relatives, which is, you would hope you like all your relatives, so you get to see, you know, all of the relatives who have passed on before, and a lot of, a lot of groups believe in that. If you were an American Indian, you might not believe that in the same way. You believe that, you, depending on your tribe, of course, your, your nation, you might believe that you're going to be reincarnated, which a lot of the tribes believe, that you would come back again. You would hope to be born into the same nation, the same tribe, but you might not. Um, or you die and you die in the wrong circumstances, like you, you know, were drowning, some spirit would come and eat your soul, and then that would be a bad thing. So I kind of like the idea of Bud Gotham standing in front of the ship with his horns. You know, I kind of think of Bud as being a man who uh, has a great time uh, with uh, Viking gods, not that he believes in Viking gods, but since his ancestors are Vikings and you're going to hang out with his ancestors, he's got to hang out with the Viking gods that they believed in. Uh, and if nothing else, he got to go sailing because he really liked the idea of sailing on that Viking ship. So 
that would probably be something close to what Bud would want. He'd want that combination. He'd get to see all the relatives that came before. He'd get to hang out with people with really great armor, and great armor who'd love to have a good time. Nine. Well, I'm not quite sure about what my heaven would be. I know that my dad said he didn't want to be uh, wearing white wings and wearing a white robe because he always got things on them, and that would be the same way. And he really didn't like the sound of harps, so he was hoping for something else. I know it wasn't an accordion because he didn't care much for that or, or banjos. So uh, he said he prefer not to go to that kind of heaven. There are some people who believe that in heaven there is beer, which I believe <laughs> covers most people. But uh, there are others that believe that uh, heaven has a beautiful city, a heavenly city. I would really be upset if heaven had a gated community. That wouldn't be nice at all. We'd like to believe that in heaven we'd all have a lovely time and get along well together and not have to worry about anything. Uh, I'm not much into the idea of an eternal heaven. I kind of like the idea of being rotated. So uh, my mother, who uh, was from the west of Ireland, believed in the idea of reincarnation because that's an old Celtic belief. And she said that uh, if you didn't do a really good job of being a human being, you got to come back again and try it all over again. So uh, I know that Bud Gunther was a great human being, so he's just going to have to go off to that great Viking heaven. But I'll be back, and I'll see you then. Farewell. Goodbye, Bud. Hope to see you in some other life. Bye. Thank you, Cheryl, for that great speech. Did a lot of research on that. And Bud was one of the finest men that I knew. He was a person that you just liked. He was such a great person. One moment of silence so that you can write a words of encouragement to Sheila. Welcome back. We are now ready to go into the part that makes Toastmasters different from any other self-improvement course. We have immediate feedback from evaluators that will evaluate each speech. And they will tell you what they did well, what they could do a little better the next time, and then what their strengths are. And our first evaluator this evening to evaluate Rich, who's the full speech, is Christy Hand. And Chris, if you would come up. Thank you, Madam Coastal. Well, Rick, you're such a, a pro at, uh, at, at these uh, speeches that it's, it's still a, another good one, of course. Um, the uh, list of questions here, and I'll kind of read off the questions so you know which, uh, how I'm going down the list of evaluation. Um, was the plot of the story clear? And I thought the, uh, the intro, the, um, the setup was very topical and clear. And everybody can relate to April Fool's Day because everybody's played a joke on somebody and everybody's also been the butt of the joke on somebody, or been the butt of the joke. So uh, certainly it was very topical and clear. And then the structure was great because you had the three three examples and the three stories that you told. And so that's, you know, really good because it's not too many and it's not too few. It, it was a real good structure. Uh, I thought it was a good conclusion. Uh, the stories and the history was so interesting that I thought the, the conclusion was a little bit of uh, somewhat of a, of a letdown. I thought I was looking for a bigger punch at the end, but it's still, I think that was because the the top, the, the stories were so good and the history was so good. Um, the second question was, to what degree did the speaker succeed in building the story to a climax? And to me, obviously, this was very good. Did, you did a very good job. And there was actually, to me, three different climaxes in this in this speech because you had three different interesting stories from three different eras. Um, how did the speaker develop the characters? Um, I, this was this was interesting because uh, the, the one character that I thought you did, I, I pictured the Einstein-looking fellow, you know, from the Swedish TV that was talking about the pantyhose. Um, but the, the, there wasn't as many characters as there were entities like Taco Bell and the Swedish TV and then also uh, the broadcast system. And uh, but I think everybody has the image of the people who who fell for the the jokes because we all have done that. And I think everybody. So there wasn't necessarily uh, specific characters in there, 
Uh, but people have had the image of, of falling for those those jokes because we all have, we all have. Um, did the speaker make effective use of description and dialogue in telling the story? Um, you, you did the rummaging through the drawers and racing through the house, and you um, you know you, you, you posed the question of I wonder who sat there uh, the longest with that twig in, in the can, you know. And so uh, so, that, so certainly did very well at uh, description and, and dialogue and in, in, t- in telling the story. And did did you great, gain greater insight into the historical event? Um, and I should have backed up and. And mentioned again that the, the topic of this uh, speech was bringing history to life. So, did you gain greater insight into the historical event or uh, or person that the speaker was uh, talking about? And you went through and talked about the history of April Fools, and some some believe it was a day, or maybe some people believe it was a week, or uh, January first versus April first, the Romans, Cambridge Tales. So, very good developing of the, and a lot of educational stuff uh, going on there. Um, and three major stories of uh, three different eras. Uh, you also used the word of the day, which was great, incorporating that. And how effectively did the speaker use vocal variety when telling the story? And I think that's what some your speeches are always uh, uh, very good because you use a lot of uh, pauses and, and inflection and, and, and different tones and, and different patterns of speech. So uh, very good. And then you also use uh, quotes and uh, the list of top 100 and climbing the ladder. Those were all good um, vocal and visual varieties for, for telling the story. So, once again, great speech. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we now have our second evaluator, and Rick Barron will be evaluating Sheila Lud Baker's speech on farewell. Where's that clapping? Thank you, Carol. I <laughs> give you the wave of encouragement up here. <laughs> Was that some ostensible clapping there? Is that what that was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. speech farewell. The objective was to provide a topic of importance to the audience, to bring specific facts, examples, and illustrations, and to incorporate everything that she's learned in all of the previous speeches. Unfortunately, we know that this is not the first time that Sheila's been through the manual, so she knows everything, and she used it in this speech. The opening, for those of us who knew Bud, hook this right in, because we all know what happened. There's a big sign on the door outside as we walked in, so very good opening in terms of catching us with a topic that we were all in tune with. The body of her speech was very good. She researched all of these different ways that people thought about the afterlife. The Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Christians, the Jews, the Hindus, the American Indians. Obviously, she used a number of different sources to find all this information. So, very good research. A lot of good illustrations, I think. That was the thing that was really good, I think, in the speech for me. And... She did that with great body language and vocal variety. Things like the Viking helmet. And um, when she talked about the next life and the journey. And when she said, you know, when he died, looked down and moved on. She used very good body uh, gestures for that. And the vocal variety was excellent when she was, you know, if it was really, really brave. You know, she used great vocal variety there. So in terms of the speech structure, very good. The purpose, right on target. In terms of an area for improvement, this is the tough part for somebody who's so good up here. The one area of improvement that I would have suggested was to have made the conclusion personal. Uh, Whether we knew Bud personally or maybe somebody that we knew that personally passed away. And somehow I like speeches that make things personal and really hook us in to the speech, especially at the very end, because as we think about that, it's something for us to take with us. In summary, well-researched, excellent use of body language and vocal variety, um, good 
flow. The topic was very appropriate and definitely right on target. It was a pleasure hearing the speech. Thank you, Sheila. Carol? Thank you, Rick, for that very in-depth evaluation. We do have another member, two more members of our team, of the evaluation team, and we will have Shankar to come up and give us the all-counter grammarian report. Let us know how well we did this evening with our grammar and our all, our killer killer words. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Hello, everyone, again. I think today my job was extremely simple. There were not too many ahs or ums or lip smacks, cattle slip smacks. <laughs> Carol, none, Rick, none, Sheila, none. Nick, it was his first speech here, and he just had two. And Chris was close to eight-ish. And if I remember right, you have drastically reduced the ums and ahs from, from prior sessions, so which is a um, which is a great improvement, which is very good. And Rick used the word ostensible thrice during the speech, which is uh, which is very good. And I know it is a somewhat of a difficult word. It's probably a G R E word. Um, and I hope to see uh, a lot of people use this uh, going forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And our last report is the timers report. If Mary will come up, Mary Arms, and give us the timers report. Mary Arms, let's hear some clapping. Good. That's better. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Well, Tyler's report is to report everything you guys said, what you do, how you do it, everything. Now, on the word power, I forgot to time that. So, we're going to go to table topics. Carol, you're a minute and 48 seconds. Rick, a minute and 18 seconds. Shankar, 50 seconds. And Nick, 55 seconds. And you guys did longer than I ever have. Uh, <laughs> and the scheduled speakers, Rick, you were 8 minutes and 55 seconds. And Sheila, 6 minutes and 26 seconds. I'm sorry, 6 minutes and 36 seconds. In the evaluation, Chris, you were 3 minutes and 51 seconds. And on these, that looks like 2 to 3 minutes normally without going over and Rick, you are three minutes and three seconds. Shankar, on the grammarian, a minute and four seconds. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mary. As the general evaluators, my job to evaluate the evaluators and to evaluate the meeting as a whole. My evaluation, the evaluators, that is one of my most difficult jobs to do. So I thought you all did very well. It showed that you were listening. And actually, an evaluation is a mini speech. It has an opening, a body, and a conclusion. And Rick did that more in his evaluation. And that's one of the things I have a hard time. Okay, how's my opening going to be and the body and conclusion? And I get very frustrated because you probably already knew if your speech had a weak opening, but if I can't give you a stronger example, I don't think I've helped you at all if I said you need a stronger opening, if I can't give you an, an illustration of a stronger opening. So I was glad to hear one thing that you did, you said something about making her ending, personalizing that ending, and you gave her a concrete example. That is what a good evaluator does in being able to do some in-depth evaluation. The all counter grammarian, you were listening to catch some of the odds and the ums and to give the encouragement that Chris may have had a few tonight, but they were about half of what he has done in the past. So he is learning and growing, and that's the benefit of being in Toastmasters. And Mary with the timer, don't feel bad if you forgot because I sometimes forget several things. 
so I, I think we did very well. I enjoyed the meme tonight. If you enjoyed the meme, let's hear a real, not an ostensible class. <laughs> And I will return control of our. Let's look and see if she's come. Does she need the door open? Return control to our presiding officer tonight, Sheila, who will have comments from the guests. Sheila Mud Baker, distinguished postmaster. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a rush. I ran out of the, uh, the control room. So, I want to start with our very youngest. Guest Carly, also known as Caroline, please come up here and tell us what it was like to be our camera assistant tonight. <laughs> so, what was your favorite one up here? What's your favorite part of this meeting besides watching Dad? Um, I don't know, but I do like listening to people talk. I'm not sure why, but I do. Well, that, that's good, because that's what we like doing. We love having an audience, so thank you very much. Will you come back and visit us again with your dad? Sure. Good. Great. Thank you. Okay. Nick, please come on up. So, tell us, what was this what you expected when you came to a Toastmasters meeting? It was, I... We had uh, someone from our corporate office where I work come and talk to us about doing Toastmasters at work, mm -hmm. but it fell apart because they didn't have enough people wanting to be involved. So I kind of had a general understanding of the layout. So, will you come so, back again? Yes. Good, because we like you. <laughs> come on back. We have our cameramen, but we need them, so they're not allowed to come up. And so, I think you come on another another time. You can uh, come up and speak. Uh, during this last uh, week, we had the um, contest for the Western Division and the Loop Divisions of um, Toastmasters. And what does that mean, Western and Loop? It means that big circle around Cincinnati and the areas south and north of it, and a little bit to the east, all the way to West Virginia. Uh, that's all District 40, but when it comes to Loop and Western Division, we're basically right around Cincinnati, including northern Kentucky, and we have a lot of clubs, and they competed. They sent uh, their best speakers or their winning speakers to the next level, and this was yet another level. Had in the winners from the Western Division and the Loop Division will move on to April 27th, 28th, 29th, especially the 28th. We're going to have another contest here in Cincinnati on way out in Eastgate. It's not way out in Eastgate if you live out there, but if you live in Anderson, it's way out in Eastgate. And uh, there will be a contest on April 28th for the winners of not only the Loop and the Western Division, uh, divisions, but also for Mountain, Central, et cetera, all these other divisions that are in West Virginia, Northern Kentucky, um, Southern and Central Ohio. So we're kind of excited because one of the winners of one of the contests, Bill Barr, was right up there, right at the, the pinnacle of the international contest and, and didn't quite make it. So this year, he plans to win the world championship. And I'm, I'm not kidding. It's world championship. Champions from 150 countries are coming. So it's pretty incredible. That won't be till August. But in April, April, right here, Cincinnati, another contest. Fortunately, it's not like uh, extreme sports. We don't knock each other down. We talk each other to death for five to seven minutes, and the winner gets to move on to the next level. So, please come see us. Maybe you would like to be a world champion. Wouldn't that be great? Come here on the first Thursday at 6 p.m. This is the Anderson Community Television Station. Come here for TV Toastmasters then. 
or come on the third Saturday of each month at 9 a.m. Yes, 9 a.m. So I'll get your coffee. Come on in. Have a good time. You don't have to speak unless there are very few people. And then if you're lucky, you can be like Nick and be called on to come up and be a table topics master, top master, table topics speaker. But if you sure you don't want to talk, but you want to be in the audience, Bring a lot of your friends, because then you can all agree that you don't speak, but they do. And until next time, have a great time. This is TV Toastmasters for April 5th, 2012. We're now done.